Welcome to Inside Healthcare. State health officials report that 70,000 Minnesota teens and young adults had at least one major mental health episode in the last year. Joining us is a Twin City psychologist to talk about mental health crisis here in Minnesota and what's being done to address this public health issue. So we're very pleased to have with you Dr. Lou Zeidner with M Health Fairview, and your title is um, System Director for Clinical Triage and Transitional Services. So really an honor to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me quite an important topic and things like that. Sure. I think before we started, I was saying how it seems like I'm running into a lot of people that COVID, what second summer in a row is still around, people are getting sick, people are anxious, they're stressed, depression and things like that. So um, what would be some of these symptoms that people might be experiencing and what would be some ways to reduce some of that anxiety and stuff? Well, it's been a difficult time for everybody and I think no matter how well you function, it, we're all functioning a little bit less well than we did two years ago. Um, so all of us have anxiety. Anxiety gets us up in the morning. Anxiety makes sure we get to work on time. Anxiety just helps to manage our motivation to do things. Additionally, we all have emotions. Uh, there are sad days and there are happy days. There are situations that make us more sad and others that make us more happy. Uh, so having a range of emotions having a range of anxiety is totally normal. Uh, for all of us, there are situations that make that worse. A uh, car stops suddenly in front of us, we get more anxious, and we feel our heart pounding, et cetera. Um, and so we all have a range of those symptoms, and the real the question is, have those symptoms started to interfere with our abilities to do day-to-day -day activities, to work, to have relationship, to, to be in family, to do whatever, we normally do that it brings us enjoyment. And when those things start to interfere, that's when we tend to want to seek out some support or some help um, from medical professionals. The realities of the pandemic is that all of us are more anxious today than we were in 19, 2019. Uh, all of us are a little bit more sad, a little bit less functional, a little bit more isolated than we were. And the question is, how do we get back to feeling more normalized? Uh, it's difficult because the pandemic doesn't feel like it's over. No, it just seems like it's never going to end. And in that context, the question is, um, everybody has their normal level of functioning. Um, and how much room do we have uh, for the stress of the pandemic and everything that goes on with that pandemic? Uh, so one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's made more people more isolated. And one of the things that improves how we feel is when we socialize more, when we interact more with loved ones, with na neighbors, family, etc. cetera. Um, so the isolation has created more of that. Uh, for a while, our schools were closed or they were intermittently closed. Uh, and some of the support that our kids had from school uh, was diminished. Um, Additionally, a lot of the services in our community closed down for periods of time. Uh, some people stopped doing the work. Uh, other people closed their offices for periods of time. Uh, so resources were less available. All of those things, I think, have uh, led to what we kind of uh, euphorically call um, some form of um, crisis or, or it feels crisis. like a crisis, it really does, a public health crisis, because it affects just about everybody, I think, yeah. in various ways and things like that. So um, I know that um, the other thing, another thing that I, I'm hearing, that there's a shortage of mental health beds as well. And some of it is that there's um, a shortage of hospital staffing and that um, there's the increased mental health crisis that's created changes in the mental health beds, lack of beds and things like that. And I know for some people, and this happened personally for a family member, a, a nephew that had a mental health crisis and um, went to the urgency room and was there for days because there was not a bed that he could get into. Yeah. So fortunately, he finally got one. He's okay, you know, he got the treatment and care he needed. Um, so you say that having um, mental health patients 
go to an emergency room is is just not the best place for them to be. And why is that? It seems like it, there's health care, there's things. Why would that not be a good place? Sure. And so just to be clear, if someone is in desperate straits and someone is feeling unsafe, um, the emergency department is the right place to go. Uh, so I would never want to say don't go to the emergency department. That is the right place to go if someone is unsafe or feeling scared, uh, et cetera. The reason I think it's not the best place for the care of patients is that emergency departments are built primarily to service people in life-threatening physical distress. So someone who's had trauma or someone who's had a cardiac arrest, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And to, to treat those folks well, uh, the environment is a very fast-paced, loud environment. Um, the lights are bright. Uh, people move quickly, people shout a lot, uh, all things that you do when you're trying to save people's lives. For someone who's having a mental health crisis, um, they're looking for a more calm environment. Um, loud shouting is not very calming, uh, it's more agitating. And so oftentimes people find that the ED uh, is, is not a calming place, it is sort of an agitating place. Additionally, the emergency departments run um, by moving quickly and, and seeing people quickly, making decisions quickly and moving on. And oftentimes people in a crisis need some time to tell their story. They need some time to explain why they believe they're, they're feeling the way they are. And emergency departments don't always feel like they give you the time to, to, to tell the whole story. And then the third element is that they really, um, they take back a lot of control in terms of saving someone's life, time is really important. And so it's not a very interactive process, okay? When you're um, coming out of a trauma, they don't talk to you a lot, they do, they act. And, and in that context, someone who's in a mental health crisis feels like they lose control even more than they might have been feeling when they came in. Um, so what we have done is to create an empath unit uh, I was going to ask what's going on to, you know, to help that, yeah. And the empath unit is designed specifically for people in a mental health crisis. So it's a very calming atmosphere. Um, it's much more like a living room than a traditional emergency department. Uh, everyone there is a mental health professional um, from psychiatry, psychology, nursing, etc. cetera. Um, the time is much more calm and, and sort of slow. So if people need a few minutes to catch their breath and just to be quiet for a minute, that's fine. There's not an urgency to interact um, on someone else's schedule. And we work really hard to have as few rules as possible. Obviously, we have to keep people safe, um, but we're, you know, we have people in their own clothes. Uh, if someone is hungry or they're thirsty, they yeah. can go and get something to eat. Uh, you don't need a call button to ask for a glass of water. Uh, some of those things that are normal parts of being an adult um, are, are still part of being an empath. So we work really hard to get people back to their normal level of functioning as quickly as possible. And we do that in part by having a calming atmosphere that lets them regain much of the control that they had in their lives. And this um, M um, PATH program is being offered at Many hospitals, some hospitals, Twin City hospitals. So or we are the first in Minnesota to have one. And Health Fairview, Southdale. And Health Fairview at Southdale. Uh, we hope to open some other ones additionally in the next year or so. Um, there um, are several throughout the country, um, probably a handful, mm -hmm. uh, but they are gaining um, merit as people see that they work and they're very effective at helping people to reduce their. their and that's crisis. helping to reduce hospitalizations as well then? That's right. Um, you know, what we have found is that by working with people and helping to de-escalate their crisis, they can get back to their normal lives quicker. Um, the historic model in a traditional emergency department tries to assess in the moment, often seeing people at their worst, um, because the moment they come into the emergency department, they're not feeling particularly good. No one starts out their day and says, I think I'm going to end up in an emergency department mm -hmm. for a mental health crisis. And so there's a tendency to keep people safe and therefore to hospitalize at a higher rate. Whereas with time, with calming, with working with people, we have found we're able to get them back into their home environments quicker. 
It kind of reminds me of a transitional care for medical conditions. Someone's had surgery and they go to transitional. So that's kind of what it sounds like, except for mental health patients and that. Right, and really working to say, you know, what was life like before this crisis and how do we help to get them back? We're just about out of time with the interview, but um, what would be some advice that you would have for our viewers, maybe if their loved one may be having a mental health crisis and thing, what some help and resources are available that, for them? So I, I think one of the recommendations I would have is act quicker as opposed to slower. You know, as, as Minnesotans, we like to be stoic. Uh, we yes. like to suck it up and um, not talk about our problems. Um, and, and that's, you know, has its good points and it has its challenges. Uh, but when someone you love or you're having some challenges, uh, don't wait. Uh, get some help earlier. Um, Oftentimes, the you know the abilities to intervene quicker uh, lead to a quicker outcome and, and, and an easier outcome. Um, the second is you know work towards not being isolated. One of the key symptoms in, in the pandemic is exacerbated. The symptom is that isolation, and you know we all have had those tougher days, um, mm -hmm. and interacting with others can be really helpful. And and the third is. Um, you know, talk to friends and family, you know, let your resources know that you're struggling and, and, and ask for the help you need. Well, great advice. Really a pleasure to have you. I know you're very busy, so thank you for taking time for being on the show. We really appreciate that. Thanks so much for attending to this issue. Yeah, thank you. We'll be talking next with a local woman who's raising awareness about Alzheimer's disease that took her mom's life, so stay with us. Uh, what do we do? You may not be able to plan ahead for a ghost encounter. Under the dining table now! But you can plan ahead for natural disasters. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Maybe it's the apocalypse. Know your evacuation routes and decide on a safe emergency meeting location. Here? I know. What a big Orlando. Protecting your family is the best plan you can make. So pass the Proton Pack to the next generation and visit ready.gov slash plan to get started. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. I'm very excited to introduce Leah Huxable. She and her sister, Eva Thompson, have an amazing fundraiser for the Alzheimer's Association. So before we talk about the Alzheimer's, um, your fundraising event, why don't you tell us, why is it so important to you and your sister to support and try to find a cure for Alzheimer's? Well, first of all, thanks for having me again. Um, so, let's see, in 2013, my mom, Lucy, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease when she was only 60 years old. She was um, still a teacher, fourth grade teacher, just vibrant and just a great lady. She had a lot of love to give yet, and um, we were not entirely surprised when this came down the pike because her mom also had Alzheimer's disease, um, but it was shocking and very, very hard to swallow because of the fact that she was so young. And like I said, she was, she had, she was always doing so many things for other people, and she had so much love to still put out in the world. And um, it got cut really significantly short. Um, so shortly after her diagnosis, about a year after, she came to live with my family and me in Woodbury here, and we cared for her for about three years in our home. And during that time, we had my sister and I had started working more closely with the Alzheimer's Association. They provide a lot of services for families who are going through this journey and um, it really helped us understand better like what our resources were and um, just the things that we could tap into to help and because of that work with them we also learned about a lot of their different programs where they try to get people to um, start doing some advocacy work on behalf of the association to push for federal funding um, so that we could you know, make some more impact. And we started doing some of that stuff. And at the same time, we're trying to do more to fundraise for our local um, Twin Cities Walk to End Alzheimer's. And we had been raising, you know, a little bit of money here and there, but felt like we could do more. And so in 2013, we founded the Bash for Brains. Wow. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so, um, the bash, it actually started out as the backyard bash to end Alzheimer's. And it was in my former backyard in Bailey's Arbor. Um, and it, we put it together in a few weeks and it raised about $7,000. And we thought, wow, we got, we've got something here. So 
we decided to keep going with it, and so this year will be our ninth year hosting it. Um, and a little and COVID in between there. Yeah, we had one year off. We say, we say this is the ninth, should be tenth um, bash this year. But anyway, we just, you know, we, we like to throw a party, and it, it was a way that we could, you know, bring more light to the disease. So many people have someone that they know who are affected, and um, it's, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, it needs to go. It's just a really, really life-robbing disease, so. You were talking about the, the journey that the families go through and mm -hmm. the, an incredible journey yeah. and how hard that is on the family and yeah. things like that and, and that you've tried a, the advocacy and stuff like that. Tell us about um, what is that like for a family? Do you so it is, um, we always say that it's, it's like living life on a loop. You know, you're, in, you're sort of in Groundhog's Day with an Alzheimer's patient and so you know, having been the, the primary care provider, um, I know it all too well. And then for my, in my situation and all of those who are dealing with like younger onset, um, parents with younger onset Alzheimer's were, all, were often kind of sandwiched between childcare as well. So my kids were really little at the time. I had actually, I, did, I only had three of them when, when my mom first came to live with us. And they call us the sandwich generation. I mean, it's just bananas trying to care for someone who is, you know, their brain is deteriorating. They, they live the same day over and over and over again throughout a day, right? Um, and so unfortunately, and luckily for me, you know, I was young and, you know, have had great support through the community and my friends and the rest of my family. But for most people, they're caring for an Alzheimer's patient when they're older. They um, have a really hard time finding the support that they need, and it is exhausting. And often, I just can't imagine. I just, it's just, it's so, so hard on the care provider. Um, in fact, th there are lots of there's statistics out there, and I don't know what the percentage is, but a very high percentage of care providers for Alzheimer's patients die before their patient because of, you know, the fatigue, the stress, and then the onset of disease that comes from all of that. Um, it's it's, it's devastating to a family. So talking about your mom with the younger age developing Alzheimer's, I think people are surprised that, you know, people as they age not necessarily are going to get Alzheimer's, but there's um, 99,000 people in Minnesota are living with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. age 85. Mm -hmm. But yet there's surprisingly a number of younger people, mm -hmm. younger, age 45 and younger, mm -hmm. being diagnosed mm -hmm. with and living with Alzheimer's here in Minnesota. People are surprised by that. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. I mean, we've, like I said, um, you know, through the Alzheimer's Association, we've been able to really, you know, get all, all kinds of great resources. But the biggest one has been the people who we can connect with that are dealing with the same issues and the, the same hardships. And um, it has been kind of mind-blowing to, to meet some people whose journeys were even more atrocious than ours just because of the incredibly young onset that some people come, you know, come to the disease with. And um, there are so many different forms of dementia, these that are, you know, constantly, we're being kind of, I don't know, in contact with, I guess, Lewy body dementia is one where they have, you know, physical and mental, you know, incapacity no. and mm -hmm. it's just awful, it's just awful, awful thing. So, yeah, it is shocking, and you know, with my mom, um, the that was the hardest part, right? Because her light went out so early, so so hard for you. But yet, yeah, you feel like there's some hope yeah. because of your may amazing fundraiser, Bash for Brains. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We're, I mean, we're definitely hopeful um, f from a federal level. The you know the Alzheimer's Association has helped to increase funding to the National Institutes of Health by hundreds fold um, over the last 10 years. They are making a lot more impact from a research perspective. And um, so, you know, when we, so we do the Bachelor Brains now every year and um, we are starting to raise a, a pretty significant amount of money. Last year we raised $110,000, which that kind is of blew incredible. our socks off. That is yeah, incredible. We're proud. Yeah. Um, we hope to do even better this year. And so in addition to fundraising towards the Alzheimer's Association, which is significant money for them, but it's not, you know, the kind of money that changes the you research. You are, though, one of the top ones here in Minnesota, right? You we usually are. Raising money for Alzheimer's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what we are also doing with the other half of the money with the Bash for Brain 
Bash for Brains is the Bash for Brains Fund, which is um, kind of handled for us fiscally by the Woodbury Community Foundation. They've been really pivotal in helping us grow the bash and be able to to start this fund. And the fund is specifically trying to help families who um, can't afford to have in-home respite care. Um, it's It was one of the things that was a saving grace for me when I was taking care of my mom. Um, having someone come in and just give you a few hours of reprieve from this sort of inundating, um, you know, constant, like I said, living like life on a loop um, was huge for me. And luckily our family was able to afford that, but so many families are not. So um, this year at the bash, we are hoping to give four grants to families who are suffering wow. um, in this community um, with the need for respite. And we were able to um, give our first grant last year to a woman who was dealing with it last, you know, during the time of the bash last year. And she was so grateful. It, it kind of, um, I mean, she's told me many times over that it changed changed um, her life. And so that's what we're hoping to be able to do this year uh, for grants so that more people can just have the benefit of some rest and it makes all the impact in the world. So. And your event's coming up in September? Yep, September 10th. Um, people can find more information about it at uh, bashforbrains.com. We actually started ticket sales on July 1st and they are on an early bird special until July 15th. You get $15 off your ticket price. Um, the Bash is a super fun event. It's in my backyard and we have um, live music. Dan Rodriguez is going to be playing this year. He is fantastic. Um, we have food trucks. Uh, that's all part of the ticket price. We have drinks and uh, these cute uh, the Fab Tap is going to be here again. They do like cocktails in this Airstream trailer thing. It's very, very fun. We have a huge silent auction and um, it's a great time. So the Bash is 6 to 11. It's an adults only event. <laughs> um, and we hope people will show up because we're trying to make a difference and I think we will. This year we're really hoping for, we have a pretty big goal financially. So, And if they can't be here, they can, they can still get involved. Yep, they can donate online through thebashforbrains.com um, or they can still bid on the silent auction um, virtually as well. It'll all be online a couple days before the bash. So yeah, we're excited. It's gotta make you feel good though to be able to help other people that were in the situation that you and your sisters were in. That's your sister exactly. Were in. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, when you know what it feels like, you know, what the day to day is like, what it, the impact that it has on the, it's, you know, we, we were talking about this the other night, my sister and I, um, we were up at the cabin for the fourth and all the grandkids were there and you know some of those grandkids my mom never even met um, and it, it's just it, that is the piece that is so heartbreaking it's it's the little kids who are missing that grandparent um, love and patience so much better than parents um, and just exposure to her wisdom and her love it's just it's so sad to me and so we're hoping to be able to obviously eradicate the disease eventually to not have that be the case, but with regards to families locally, you know, it's just trying to make it a little better for people, so. Well, Leah, I really appreciate you taking time to share your message and, and trying to find a cure for Alzheimer's. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Appreciate that. We'll be right back with more after this. Introducing a new day of the week, someday. Now, everything you were going to do someday is on the calendar. Want to retire someday? You'll really want this. A My Social Security account at socialsecurity.gov. You can estimate your future benefits and manage current benefits online. Millions of people have a My Social Security account. Get yours today, because someday is here at socialsecurity.gov. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. We're coming to you from inside the urgency room in Egan, and we are talking with Dr. Rob Anderson. So glad to have you back on the show. So yeah. Oh, thank you coming, for coming to Egan today. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's another hot summer day, and the weather um, forecasters are saying that this hot weather, the higher than warmer temperatures we're going to see the rest of this month and even into August throughout Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So 
What are you already seeing as far as heat-related type of injuries? Yeah, it has been a very hot summer so far. We had some days into the hundreds already too, and the humidity adds it as well. So a, com a couple common things that we see with the heat is going to be dehydration and sunburn. So surprisingly, we do actually see a fair amount of patients who come in because they just have such profound sunburn. And honestly, there's not too much that we can do besides recommending, you know, maybe aloe or keeping the skin hydrated with a good lotion, drinking water. Sometimes the pain is pretty intense from the sunburn and, and Tylenol does help. Ibuprofen is a good anti-inflammatory that helps. Sometimes if you have a lot of blistering and I mean it's significant burns from the sun, I mean then you need to go to a burn center and we can recognize that and, and recommend additional follow-up care at the hospital. Um, there's a medication that we can prescribe that kind of helps nerve pain that sometimes maybe helps with really bad sunburn. Um, so that's an option as well. So sunburn is one thing that we see related to the heat and the other thing that we see is dehydration. I see a lot of people just you know out playing sports, running on the soccer field, you know in the heat of the day and they just get really dehydrated and they come in for IV fluids. So even though it's humid, mm -hmm. they get dehydrated, which yep, seems exactly. like it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, you're just right. a, you yeah. know sweating so much, your your body's uh, evaporating so much water, trying to keep you cool, and you get dehydrated from that. Any things that you would recommend to preventing getting dehydrated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, if you know that you're going to be out playing a soccer game or softball, or if you're going to be out at the beach all day, make sure you drink enough water before going out to the beach. Before. before. Yeah. yeah. And then as you're going, you should be drinking enough water. You should, you know, halfway through a game, you should be having to go use the bathroom to urinate. I mean, uh, going needing to urinate is a good sign that you're staying well hydrated. Um, you know, and as far as being in the sun as well, just make sure that you wear sunscreen, wear long sleeves if needed. Um, if you can't wear much sunscreen. Um, and also be mindful of medications that you might be on that could increase oh. your risk of sunburn as well. What would be some of those examples? So two common medications that we prescribe that I like to warn patients about is uh, Bactrim um, is a sulfa-based medication that is a common antibiotic that we use to treat urinary tract infections and a lot of common skin, skin disorders I as well. I wouldn't even thought that, yeah. And then doxycycline is another antibiotic that we actually prescribe for Lyme disease. And people are on that for sometimes 10 to 21 days if you're being treated for Lyme disease and that increases your sun sensitivity so if you're on those antibiotics you should be mindful that when you go outside that you should be certainly wearing sunscreen because you'll burn a lot quicker um, when you're out in the sun and several other me medications common prescriptions can do that as well and the pharmacists here in Minnesota are great about putting you know the labels on those and advising you that it does cause increased sun sensitivity especially if you're around the water too I mean it's even more intense right yep if you're gonna be out on a boat if you're gonna be swimming in the lake all that water just reflects up on you and you know sometimes you go out in the water and we're wearing a sunscreen that you know goes off in the water and maybe is not necessarily waterproof and um, so we think that we did a good job of putting sunscreen on and then all of a sudden it washes off in the water I always worry about the little ones I can't even tell mm -hmm. you you know, they've been and just kind of keeping an eye that they're not out too long, but yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and elderly too, I think. Yep, right. yeah, the extremes of ages are those who are going to uh, most suffer from um, dehydration, which can lead to, lead to heat exhaustion or even a further extreme of a heat stroke as well. And what would be some of those symptoms if someone has been in the heat too long or in the sun too long that they would have a heat stroke sure. or, or just? Other. So the, the spectrum is you start off, you know, with maybe dehydration leading to heat exhaustion that, that proceeds to heat stroke. So, you know, if you're feeling really thirsty, that's a sign you're probably behind the game on your water drinking. Um, your heart rate going really fast, you feel kind of weak and dizzy. Those are signs of heat exhaustion. Um, sometimes the skin will actually get kind of cool and clammy despite being out in the hot weather. Um, so you feel just, you, you'll feel dehydrated. You'll, your mouth might feel really dry. Um, so at that point, you need to just start drinking lots of water. But unfortunately, one of the things that occurs with heat exhaustion is that you get nauseous. Uh, so sometimes people actually start throwing up just because they're so incredibly dehydrated. And that's one of the common things that we see related to heat here at the urgency room is patients come in because they're dehydrated, they're throwing up, um, and they, they're suffering heat exhaustion. So we provide them IV fluids and oftentimes being out of the heat in an air-conditioned environment with IV fluids and medication to help with nausea will help them to feel better. Well, Dr. Rob Anderson, yeah. always great advice. Thank you. Thank we you, Jody. appreciate your time. And we thank you for joining us on Inside Healthcare. See you again next time.